everybody to our webinar, Campus Culture Run Amok. Um, I'm Miriam Elman. I'm Executive Director of the Academic Engagement Network and an Associate Professor at Syracuse University. Um, and just in time for Purim, uh, we thought what could be more perfect than to welcome our AN members to Nevergreen. Um, it's a campus where no one can manage to distinguish between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. And longtime AN member Andy Pessin will discuss his new satirical novel and the challenges facing Jewish and Zionist students and faculty. Um, my colleague Josh Sukoff and I will spend about 30 minutes uh, with Andy um, uh, parsing through uh, Nevergreen, uh, which everybody on the webinar will receive, uh, thanks to a very generous donor. Um, and, uh, and then we'll open uh, the conversation to your questions and comments, and we really look forward to the discussion. Um, the chat, by the way, is open. Uh, we want to keep this informal, so please feel free to write comments and questions uh, as we go. Um, so many of you, you know, know Andy, um, but let me provide a short introduction. Um, Andrew Pesson is Campus Bureau Editor of the Alga Minor and Professor of Philosophy at Connecticut College. Um, in addition to his academic work, he has authored three novels, including most recently Nevergreen, which is a satirical account of campus culture and its ideological excesses and their impact on the Jews. And his co-edited book, um, Anti-Zionism on Campus, um, The University, Free Speech and BDS was published in 2018 uh, by Indiana University Press. And his co-edited book uh, with AN member Corinne Blackmer, uh, was uh, just published by um, ISCAP in uh, 2021, Poisoning the Wells, Anti-Semitism in Contemporary America. Um, and, and both of these books, um, you know, include uh, many AN members as, as contributors. Um, and I'm pleased to have actually a chapter in, the, in this one. Um, so we, we were really pleased too at AN to be able to provide a, a subvention grant for uh, anti-Zionism on campus. And, and if you haven't read this uh, and you haven't ordered yet uh, Poisoning the Wells, I mean, these are really fantastic volumes um, on our issues. Uh, of course, more information about Andy and his, and his work in philosophy uh, and on our issues can be found on his website, uh, www.andrewpesson.com. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Josh Sukhoff, to ask the first couple questions. Great. Thank you so much, Miriam, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am the managing director for AEN. I joined about seven months ago, so this is a real pleasure to be able to put a lot of great names to beautiful faces. Uh, glad to be part of this webinar. Andy? Good afternoon. Hope you're doing well. We're excited to spend this time with you. Before we get into Nevergreen and talking about the book itself, I want to zoom out for a moment, if we could. Uh, Miriam just talked about, you know, the other uh, books that you've written or you've co-edited, and, and um, they're primarily works of nonfiction. Um, you've written about philosophy, of course, as a professor of philosophy. Um, I I'd like to know if there was some underlying reason that you decided to write Nevergreen as a satirical novel, right? As opposed to writing uh, another work of nonfiction about campus culture, campus uh, cancel culture. Why a satirical novel? What, what's the underlying reason there? Uh, thank you, Josh, for that question. But first, let me thank Miriam and AEN for this wonderful opportunity. And of course, thank our generous donor who will provide you all with copies of the books. Uh, and let me also urge those of you who aren't familiar, if, if these are, your issues, Jews, Zionism, anti-Semitism, campus, et cetera, which obviously they are if you're here, um, please do consider following me on Twitter. And also I do moderate a Facebook group called Anti-Zionism on Campus. Uh, and it would be wonderful to have you join that if you aren't there already. It's also a treat to see some familiar names and faces on the Zoom screen and see some less familiar ones. So thank you for 
being here. Um, and the last thing I will say, put out one last little plug, is if you do happen to end up reading the book and liking the book, any help spreading the word would be greatly appreciated. Posting reviews on Amazon, sharing with family, friends, colleagues, social media, et cetera. End of plug. OK, so thank you, Josh, for that first question. Um, uh, you know, I think if, if just about everybody here is an academic, and we we know what our normal bread and butter and writing the nonfiction stuff that we do, which I of course has important value and merit. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. But um, after doing it for a good number of years, um, I think just the quick answer to your question is writing a novel is for me anyway much more fun than the nonfiction stuff, uh, and. Uh, the nonfiction stuff is really hard. It's important and it's valuable, but it's really hard. And as we know, so much is published. It's incredible. It's impossible to keep up with all the important works in our own fields, much less if, if you broaden your interests beyond, let's say in my case, from philosophy to Israel and Jews and et cetera. It's just impossible to keep up and the books keep pouring out. And uh, every book you read is taking hours away from something you yourself might be writing. And so after a number of years, I think um, I felt overwhelmed by the production of nonfiction. And again, I don't wanna devalue it. It's essential, it's necessary, and there's so much good work out there. But um, in the hope that maybe something could reach a broader audience as well. So the, the nonfiction stuff that most of us produce, you know, it's read by the same, in some cases, couple of dozen people, maybe if we're lucky, a couple of hundred people or something along those lines. And uh, the idea of maybe reaching more people by writing something a little bit more accessible and more fun um, is was a primary motivation in writing a novel. Um, uh, the, the dream, of course, would be to reach lots of people with this novel. That's a hard thing to do. But I think uh, uh, without question, I've already reached more people with the novel than I've reached with any of my nonfiction works. So if that's the goal, just get, the, get, get some message out there, then the, the vehicle of a novel is, uh, is at least one possibility. Uh, and the fact that it was fun to do is, you know, as also was, was a bonus. As far as doing a satirical novel, that was also part of your question. Um, you know, that's that's an interesting call given the subject matter. So the, the general theme of the novel is, of course, campus cancel culture in, in particular. And in a way, you know, this would be one of these cases where perhaps a satire and the real thing are indistinguishable. There's just so much, in my view, craziness going on on campuses today that you almost don't need to make it fiction to make it make it read like a satire. That said, um, it's it. it the campus cancel culture scene in particular, I would argue campus culture in general, but specifically the cancel aspect of it is just crying out for a satirical, um, a satirical treatment. I, I think it's literally crazy in some of its manifestations in some of, some of these campuses, literally crazy. And the fact that people don't see it as crazy is a problem. And so um, I think I was partly inspired uh, here by Saul Alinsky's famous Rules for Radicals. I think that was back in the 70s. I think was it rule number four was something that ridicule or, or mocking is a, an extremely powerful weapon. And I guess the dream would be this. Uh, so those of you who might have seen what I think is the greatest movie of all time, and I consider myself an amateur student of film, Spinal Tap. This is Spinal Tap, which was a mockumentary uh, making a satire out of the heavy metal scene back in the, was it the 80s? I think it was the 80s. Um, I, I read an interview from some heavy metal um, uh, musicians a couple of years afterwards who said that movie was so devastating to them because the satire was so on target that they could no longer um, behave as they normally behaved without being aware of how, how ridiculous they were, right? It really, and it, it changed the, the mode of behavior. So my dream would be, not that I could compare my novel to Spinal Tap, but the dream would be that if the satire is effective and it gets out to the right audiences, that as these scenes emerge on campuses, more of the campus stakeholders would be, would be aware that we're living in Nevergreen now. And that's the moment when you, know, you, you, you get a, a bit of enlightenment and you realize something has gone wrong if we are living in Nevergreen now. So that was the motivation to make this a satirical novel. Thank you. Thank you for, for that answer. Um, you know, I'm thinking of Rules for Radicals, which actually is 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 one of my I have it on my on my bookshelf, um, right? And and one of those rules, if I'm remembering correctly, is that the the threat is usually more terrifying than the actual thing itself. I, I want I want to like take that a little bit and twist it to ask you if you think 
campus cancel culture and what's going on, the themes in the book that you've just talked about, are they really as terrifying or, or um, are, are, is there room to, to kind of laugh about it a little bit as, as you're maybe helping us do through this novel? Um, so uh, the AEN folks were generous enough to shoot me a few questions in advance that I could give some thought to, but this was not amongst them. So this was it a wasn't, new one. Well, yeah, so, rules for so, radicals. So we got, right. So, know, so a, a little bait and switch <laughs> going on here, um, which is, of course, totally fine. So uh, um, happily, I'm finding that the majority of people who at least are responding to me and reading the book, I'm getting some very positive reviews and endorsements. But of course, there's always a, there's some clunkers out there, some people who ha did not take to the book and felt they needed to let me know about that. And um, at least one of the criticisms of the book, and I don't want to give anything away. I'm not assuming anyone here has read the book yet, or maybe a handful have, but, um, and I don't want to give away spoilers, but uh, part of the story of the book, I'll give a brief, I can give a brief plot summary in a moment, but part of the story of the book is this guy gives a talk and he becomes the target of cancel culture. And as the publisher's blurb puts it, with potentially fatal consequences. So I, I want to avoid spoilers there as to what happens, but certainly this individual feels as if he's being targeted by a homicidal mob. Right. And so some of the criticism I've received is like, that's too much. It's not like that. There's no real threat going on. Maybe when a, a cancel campaign is happening, there's a lot of sound and fury, but no real physical threat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and some have felt that that this sense that the main character has that he is being chased down by a homicidal mob is too much of an exaggeration to swallow. And I guess respectfully, I, I disagree. Um, obviously, cancel campaigns vary from place to place, from person to person, you know, from stakeholder to stakeholder, et cetera. So it's hard to generalize, but um, they really amount to mob scenes in many, many instances and cases. And when, when there's a mob scene, things get out of control. I think people um, uh, really sort of lose the control, the reins that normally can control them in. And indeed, uh, in particular, and we will get to this maybe right now, um, Although the book does not mention Jews, there's no Jewish people on this campus, et cetera. Secretly, it's actually all about the Jewish situation on campus. And I think um, when you are the target of a, can of a cancel campaign, if you think about what these cancel campaigns are trying to do, they are trying to eliminate your voice, right? They are trying to eliminate your presence on campus in many, many cases. Um, and when you think about how pro-Israel students have been targeted on campuses in a number of places where campuses are just awash with this hateful, libelous, slanderous rhetoric calling not merely Israel, but supporters of Israel on campus, um, Zionist students, let's call them, um, they are supporters of genocide and ethnic cleansing and racism and, and colonialism and imperialism and all that sort of stuff. That is very, very dangerous rhetoric. And it seems to me it is not that far off that there will be some serious violence on campus. There, it's already bubbling around the edges. There've been a number of cases, just a couple, a few weeks ago, there was that former UCLA grad student um, uh, who was arrested after putting out a whole screed that was against white people and Jews on campuses. Um, and there've been other cases like that. It's, it's just behold, below that threshold. Mark. And we also, of course, saw last year um, with the, the Gaza war, um, the outburst of violent anti-Semitism in the streets and also on campuses. So it seems to me that um, that real violence is a real possibility um, on campuses as well. It just takes one crazy person. We like to think that's a crazy person. But when you are steeped in rhetoric and you come firmly to believe that the Jews on your campus are part of a world conspiracy in supporting ethnic cleansing and genocide. It, it's not that far of a leap to imagine some serious violence occurring. So in my opinion, which is maybe a little pessimistic, we're close to that threshold point and it's a foreseeable outcome of the kind of rhetoric that we see on campuses. And lastly, one of the goals of the book is to um, get across what it feels like to be the target of a cancel campaign, the subjective aspect of it. Most of us, if you, uh, if you haven't had the pleasure yourself and you just read some stories, you can sort of appreciate they're not pleasant. But, but if you have had the pleasure of being targeted yourself, um, you really feel like they're coming for you. They're coming for you. They want you gone and they want you gone 
literally physically from the campus, as well as, of course, they want your voice silenced and your opinion silenced as well. Um, and it certainly feels like they're coming for you. Um, and I wanted to get that feeling across. So just even just the purely subjective aspect of it. And so that's what I say to the people who didn't like the craziness of the novel, which is I think there's it's getting at a real point, which is I really do believe there's a, th a physical threat here. And subjectively, this is what it feels like to be the target of a cancel campaign. Thank you so much. Um, Miriam, can I turn it back over to you? You had some questions. Yeah, um, you know, I have a lot of favorite passages that, you know, I've, I've kind of dog ear here. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think your point about this being very up close and personal, and when we think about um, the anti-Israel movement on campus, right, the detractors typically say, you know, we're only targeting Israeli institutions, right, academic institutions, as if it's possible to boycott uh, a university and not actually harm the people who teach, work, right. and study in there, right? But but even that, I mean, I think that that there actually is on the part of at least um, some advocates and proponents to cause maximum pain um, and, and to actually um, uh, um, you know harm professionally, uh, it's not physically, but like harm professionally. Um, individual scholars, and we just saw that case at Columbia, uh, uh, a, a faculty member at Teachers College uh, put out a call to 150 colleagues on a listserv saying uh, to them, urging them to boycott a special issue of brain sciences that a scholar at Haifa University is putting right. together and telling them, do not submit there do not submit to his special issue because he's at an apartheid institution. Haifa University is an apartheid institution. And it's like, well, wait, wait a minute. That, that you're, you're actually like preventing him from publishing something, you know I mean? It's very personal. It, yeah. it, it, it actually has and carries professional risk. So, um, you know, that I think is the, you know, one of the profound messages of, of your book that this really is um, it's personal. It can impact faculty. You know, it yeah. can, it is impacting faculty. It's not only students; it's also faculty. Now, Andy, can you share a passage that you think would particularly resonate for AN members on the call? Um, sure, but it does occur to me that maybe we should go to what was your first pre-question, which is a brief summary of the plot, because okay, assuming yes, most yes, people haven't read it, right? Knows. Yeah, right, right. So let me just do that first, which is uh, I'll, I'll, I'll more or less paraphrase the publisher's blurb, which I think is a fairly good one. So uh, Nevergreen tells the story of Jay, and that's um, uh, Jay with a period, uh, abbreviation Jay, a physician in a midlife funk. A chance encounter gives him the opportunity of a lifetime and invitation to speak at a small college. But when he arrives at the secluded island campus of Nevergreen College, not by accident the former site of the Nevergreen Asylum for the Lunatic, Imbecile, and Idiot, and also not by accident, similar to Evergreen State College, just in name alone, which is a sort of ground zero for a lot of, um, of these sort of issues, um, he gets a lot more than he bargained for. No one actually shows up for his talk, and that's actually an important element maybe we'll get a chance to talk about. No one hears what he has to say, but that doesn't stop it from becoming the center of a firestorm of controversy. He becomes the target of a cancel campaign on this campus with potentially fatal consequences, trying to avoid spoilers. Nevergreen aims to be a smart, fast, funny, and incisive portrait of today's liberal arts college scene, campus cancel culture, and more, and just emphasize the word fun or funny. It's, it's also meant to be entertaining. So hopefully it succeeds in that. And I, I do appreciate you dog-eared some pages. I've dog-eared a few pages uh, on my own as well. Um, and so that's what it's about. And as I mentioned, there's nothing explicit about the Jews in here or Israel that doesn't come up in this book at all. And yet, in fact, ultimately, deeply, secretly, the book is all about the Jewish experience on campus. I deliberately, this is not answering your question yet, I'm, I'm working my way towards it, but um, I deliberately wanted to proceed that way. I didn't want to write a book that was explicitly about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or anything along those lines for a, a number of reasons. But one reason amongst them is this. Um, I do think that um, a lot of the key ideology that is governing so many campuses these days 
is on the surface appealing and positive and virtuous. And that will include things like um, critical race theory and social justice and intersectionality and terms we're all familiar with here. On the surface, they are wonderful, positive, appealing, virtuous. There's, there's things going for them. There's, there's reasons why people are drawn to these things. But I would argue a little bit below the surface, deep down, certainly the way these ideas get manifest in actual practice on a lot of campuses, they are profoundly anti-Semitic, or at least profoundly antagonistic to the welfare and perspective of Jews on campuses. So in the same way, on the surface, this book is not about the Jews at all, but when you start pushing a little bit more deeply, you'll realize there's all sorts of little signposts along the way that it's very much about the Jews. Um, uh, and starting with just, for example, that the main character who goes by the initial J, if you like, make that Jew, and that'll, that'll go a long way towards explaining this. So what it's trying to get across is what it might feel like to be a Jew on campus, uh, and in particular, a Jew who doesn't hate Israel, supports Israel, but uh, J is, of course, the Jew um, on, on this campus. So he gives this talk, nobody shows up because sometimes that happens as well. And uh, nevertheless, uh, somehow through the magic of ideology. So this is another, this is one of the general themes of the book as I work my way towards a specific passage, but through the magic of ideology, this character who is, I would suggest uh, innocuous, mild mannered do-gooder maybe, you know, a technical term, a schmo or something like that. This guy is as just innocuous as you could possibly imagine. He somehow gets turned into the face of hate, capital F, capital H, in that expression on this campus. He comes to represent for the students who are initiating this campaign against him, everything they hate. It has little or nothing to do with who he actually is or anything he actually says or does. Remember, no one showed up for his talk. And yet, through the lens of the ideology that grips him, he becomes this thing to them that they, they hate and they need to stamp out in the campaign whose slogan is hate, hate. We must, right? Hate is the thing we hate, so hate, hate. Um, which uh, is also getting at this other theme here that sometimes on campuses, it can be a little hard to tell who's the good guy and who's not the good guy in some of these debates. And so we have this reigning ideology, which in the name of justice and virtue, et cetera, is all about stamping out hate on campus, but it's not impossible that on some level, th that movement and those movers are motivated by hate, the very hate they allegedly are stamping out. So, so if you endorse hating hate, you will notice, of course, that to do that, you need to be a hater. Yes, you claim it's hate that you hate, but nevertheless, you're driven by hate. And in the same way, many of these campus movements, these ideologies that I mentioned earlier, on the surface, there's a lot of value, virtue, appeal to them, et cetera, et cetera. But once you see the senses in which they are anti-Semitic, that they are driven by a kind of hatred of Jews, you realize that the people it, who are acting in the name of anti-racism might in fact be racist. So that's, that's one of the themes of the novel, what ideology can, can do to you. So that said, um, let me go to a passage. Uh, and it was, of course, tough to choose a passage. It's sort of like asking to choose between your children. Although actually in my case, I think we have a fairly clear ranking. <laughs> um, but for most people, that's a difficult question. Um, the book does try to take equal aim at students, faculty, and administrators. Um, uh, everyone gets, gets a taste of the satire. Um, but I thought for maybe AEN, this group, a segment about the administration might be most appropriate, about the administration trying to deal with the situation as this cancel campaign builds steam and gets scarier and scarier and more and more hateful with potentially fatal consequences, not to give anything away. Um, the administration is trying to deal with it. And just a, a few words of preparation before I go to the passage. Um, one of the themes here is the incompetence of the administration in dealing with the situation they have on their hands. I, I think administrators typically are, are not really trained for crisis management. That's not why they got into the business. Many, right, they come through academia, especially we don't sign up for academia expecting to get into crisis management. So I think a lot of them just don't have the training for dealing with a campus crisis of this sort. Uh, and they're, they're also, of course, dealing with what I think is a pretty deep contradiction in most university policies. 
Namely, they are, of course, at least officially, they give lip service to being pro-free speech and pro-academic freedom. That's part of the, the essence of the academic endeavor. But now, of course, many campuses are deeply committed to things they call anti-racism or anti-hate, et cetera, um, and take active measures to exclude racism and hate from campuses, which obviously ends up impinging on the academic freedom when things various people say are judged to be hateful or racist. And so you've got that the contradictory tension there. You want to be pro-free speech, but you also want to stamp out racism and hate. And so what do you do when these collide, which is what happens in many of these campus cancel campaigns? And so you see the administrators bumbling around, I think, trying to protect the freedom of the accused offenders while also often leading campaigns that delegitimize the accused offenders. All of this is particularly difficult and complicated in the context of anti-Zionism on campus, which many can pretend is a legitimate political opinion protected by academic freedom, but which just might be a covert expression of hateful anti-Semitism, um, which is not protected by academic freedom, at least as it manifests on campuses these days. So I think administrators often look like deer in the headlights, in my opinion, as you sort of watch the way they bumble through this. Um, and then, um, yeah, let me say one more thing and then I'll read the passage. Um, in my opinion anyway, and probably shared by at least some on this call, you, you, you have what I think is a, a fascinating inversion of reality going on. The same sort of thing where the people in the name of anti-hate are the true haters and the people in the name of virtue and justice are actually anti-Semites, right? So something is literally inverted upside down there. Um, so what you'll see in the passage to come, this is, gets reflected by um, what we might call blaming the victim, as you'll see in the passage to come. So at one point, the character suggests he'll get a lawyer and they, they respond, no, 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 that'll be seen as aggressive. Whereas, of course, he needs a lawyer because there are aggressors aggressing against him. So the defensive mechanism is seen as an aggressor, aggressive mechanism. He, he claims he's, he insists he'll use his free speech to defend himself. And they, they, they shut that down as well, because then you're, you're blaming the attackers for being offended by you by defending yourself. So the defensive, defensive mechanism becomes seen as an act of offense or aggression. Uh, and then lastly, one of my own favorite lines, and well, I'll, I'll highlight it when I get there. So I have a, a few lines that I particularly am proud of and like as well. So, all right, let me go um, to the passage. And uh, does that work? You see that? Some thumbs up. Okay, great. I'm going to skip around a little. So it be a little hard, might be a little hard to follow, but I'll try to indicate where I am. I'm not going to read all of this, but um, so... I'm going to, whoops, no, that didn't work. If you see the cursor on the left of page 124, that's about where I'll start. The character J, things are starting to get out of control on the campus, and he goes to the administration for help to try to cope with this. And keep in mind, this is a secluded island campus, and he can't get off until the next ferry. So he's trapped on this campus um, while this movement is building steam against him. And so, um, uh, Al is the name of one of the administrators, a key administrator. So she says, how may we best support you? This is where I am here. Um, Jay, who hadn't minded not participating in the conversation, realized he now had to. You can stop them from attacking me, he said with measured desperation. Attacking you, Al said. They're not attacking you, Louise said. It's not about you, Al said. Not about me, not at all. The OCs, those are offensiveness complaints which had been lodged against him after his talk. The OCs that started all this off, Robert, who's a faculty member asked, weren't they about him? And speaking of, unresolved, Al reported, Bob, who's the campus president, who's largely absent throughout the whole thing. Bob says, we must allow the wheels of virtue to turn. But that's directly about me, Jay protested. A purely impersonal process, Louise shook his hair again. Rules, procedures established independently, entirely out of our hands. Not at all about you, my dear, Al said again. But what about this? So Jay now um, pulls out his phone to go to the website the students have set up to run this campaign against him and notices that an image of his face has come up. And so I'm now on the upper, moving up. Oops, just trying to hide there. I'm on the upper right there. Um, Oh, so it's an image of his face on the screen. Oh, that's not about you, Al said. Not at all, Louise added, blinking. But that's my face. It fills the entire screen. 
That's not your face, my dear, Al objected. At most a resemblance, your face shadows are barely half as sinister. Almost definitely not you, Louise agreed. They probably just took that off the internet. That's probably just somebody Photoshopped to look like you. And even if it were you, it symbolizes something else entirely. Jay couldn't follow his logic. I think they're trying to kill me. They were screaming, kill the beast when they came into the sanctuary for me. That's impossible, Al declared. Killing you would almost definitely be against the virtue code, Louise said. Perhaps you misheard, Robert chimed in. I did not mishear, Jay scowled at Robert. It was very clear, kill the beast, cut his throat. So those of you who are familiar with Lord of the Flies, that's right out of Lord of the Flies, which is a important influence and theme. Uh, the campus of Nevergreen is not dissimilar to the island of Lord of the Flies. Um, so kill the beast, cut his throat. Um, kill the priest, maybe, Robert ventured, gut his boat. Um, uh, so they continue to essentially gaslight him, to use uh, trendier terms. Let's see, how do I get down to the next page? I got this thing is in my way. There we go. I should get to the next page. Skipping now a bit. So um, over here, upper left of 126, where the cursor is, there was a long silence. I'll get a lawyer, Jay said into the silence. No, friend Jay, listen, Alia answered quickly. That will be seen as aggressive. You'll take a leave instead, effective immediately. But I don't work here. Fair point, Aaliyah conceded, her voice softening. Listen, my dear, may I suggest that we all just take a deep breath, that we have some refreshment, some poco, perhaps. So poco, poco plays the role of Soma, uh, if you're familiar with Brave New World, which is also an influence in the novel. Um, and uh, the faculty, the administrators in particular, regularly drink this liquid called poco, not dissimilar from the uh, uh, abbreviation for post-colonialism, just putting that out there. Um, Wood and should do make you ill, drink a glass and it will pass. She indicated the pitcher and compostable cups along the low shelf. Um, uh, and perhaps not surprisingly, it's the consumption of Poco, which fuels some of this craziness here, um, a little editorializing. And then let's just go to the last bit. Um, up, uh, upper left of 128, where the cursor is. Uh, uh, entering the room now is Sean. Sean is a student shadow. Uh, many of the administrators, the students appoint shadows to follow the administrators around. The students have an inordinate amount of power on the campus of Nevergreen, uh, partly due to the ideology that everybody is equal. And so they struggle greatly with the ordinary hierarchies. They're constantly, for example, someone is would be called the vice president if they still use that title. So they're so against hierarchies, they're trying to make everybody equal. And part of that is they have students teaching some of the classes and things like that. So Sean is the student monitor, the student shadow. We were just explaining to our friend, Aaliyah continued, that there's really nothing we can do or should do to stop anyone from expressing their feelings here. Freedom of feeling and freedom to express feelings are among our highest community values at Nevergreen. And the virtue code dictates that we uphold them at all costs. Like it or no, my dear, the resistance, which is the name of the movement that's running this campaign, the resistance has the right to speak. And the students would be upset at any effort to silence them as well. Louise glanced knowingly at Sean, who glanced knowingly back. But this, that is outrageous, Jay. He's begging them to just discourage the students from the campaign. But that's outrageous, Jay almost whispered. Well, we support your free speech too, Al affirmed. If that right belongs to you, then surely it belongs to them as well. Particularly, she looked meaningfully at him and dropped her voice, given the controversial things you said. What? What was controversial? It may not have been the words per se, but your free speech created controversy. Therefore, it was controversial, Louise said. Um, and then skipping uh, last bit to the uh, here, bottom of this page, and then we'll wrap up. Then can't you just discourage them somehow? Ask them to refrain from judgment? Wait till the facts are in? Wait until I've had a chance to defend myself? Jay paused. I'll use my free speech. I'll defend myself. Oh, no, Al and Louise exclaimed. No, 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 Al added firmly. You mustn't do that, my dear. Defend myself? Absolutely not. You'll just get everyone angrier at you, as if you're blaming them for being offended by you. Just stay silent, Louise said. Let us handle it for you. But you've just said you can't stop them. You can't even discourage them. Exactly, Al said. We'll ignore them, Louise added. Yes, Al agreed. That's precisely what we'll do. Nothing. So there you have him. Uh, not getting much help from the administration. And indeed, these administration actions ultimately help support and fuel the campus campaign, a uh, cancel campaign against him. And the line that's one that I particularly like is this one over here, your free speech created controversy, therefore it was controversial, which is of course, 
if that if it's effective, if that line works, what it's getting at is what he actually said. Because remember, no one was at the talk, so they don't even know what he said because it doesn't matter. Um, and normally when you say something's controversial, you're making some claim about the content of what was said, that there was something problematic in the content. But of course, the content in this case is utterly irrelevant. It's controversial because of the way people responded to it, not because of the content. And so we have here another instance where it, in, uh, in essence, they're blaming the victim here. They want to use him for whatever their particular ends are. And so they accuse him of being controversial, but of course the controversy is something they have entirely manufactured. So uh, there's a passage, one sample passage of the book. Thank you for that opportunity. Thanks, Andy, that, that was great. And that was actually what I also marked off. Nice. Um, and, you know, for me that, the, the sentence on 127, where one of the administrators says, don't worry, they have a short attention span. <laughs> and in, a, in a few days, they'll entirely forget about this whole thing. And they'll be angry at something else, which, which is true. But right. they've left, they've left um, the, the, the either students that were harassed or the faculty member uh, picking up the pieces, right? And, and in the chat, a number of people have have have, have you know mentioned um, personal incidents or incidents on their campuses and feeling isolated, feeling traumatized, feeling uh, uh, ostracized, alienated from from uh, you know campus spaces, uh, and and you know many are telling us that AEN feels like a bit of a support group. Um, yeah. Uh, that you know particularly our sections and interest groups where people can share and come together and really find um, ways to, to deal with all this. Um, I am interested in, in having you share some suggestions on, on what to do, um, what Jewish Zionist students, faculty uh, uh, should be doing, but I wanna actually open it up to uh, comments and, and, and um, uh, some of them have come into the chat. And, and, and I think through your, your answers and this give and take, we'll be able to hear also some of your um, uh, suggestions. So um, before you, let me just say go ahead. 30 more seconds and then let's open, open up, which yep. is um, uh, the isolation is important. So those who, I haven't looked at the chat, but if you, if you're the target of a cancel campaign, it is, it, it can be incredibly isolating in the novel. Of course, he's on this secluded Island. And it also turns out it's like the largest Wi-Fi dead spot or whatever. So he's got, he's literally cut off from civilization. He's cut off from his wife and family and he's absolutely on his own. And the, um, even the one person he thinks seems to be on his side, that, that faculty member, Robert, that was in that passage, you know, it turns out might not be on his side. Um, uh, and that's terrifying. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is these campaigns, even when, you know, they can be, some people see them as a tempest in a teapot, you know, who cares what goes on on a little campus like Nevergreen, uh, et cetera. Um, they're actually devastating, not just to the individual targeted, and that can be faculty or student. They're, they're, they're scorched earth campaigns sometimes, and they, um, they don't merely harm the individuals. They, they can tear apart communities. Dividing lines get drawn. Like if something is happening on a campus, people have to decide, are you with or are you against? There's no middle ground available anymore when a cancel, can, cancel campaign is underway. And it literally, it breaks friendships, it breaks relationships, it destroys dialogue. Uh, and ultimately they produce an atmosphere of fear. And you're all familiar with lots of surveys that have been coming out like in the past year that on campuses, students and professors are afraid to speak, to think, to discuss, because you're afraid of who you're, who you're gonna piss off and you become the target of a cancel campaign yourself. So they really damage not just the individual's target, they damage the entire community and they damage the entire institution. It is hard to throw yourself into the pursuit of truth, however you define that, if you are afraid to speak and afraid to debate and afraid to criticize <laughs> because you might be targeted. So these are, they're really serious. They're not just tempest in a teapot. And, you know, we can make fun of the students because they have short attention spans and they might move on, but the damage that's going on is serious. And the conditions which enable these things to happen are, are more permanent, right? And so I'm sure we'll get to that as we look at the questions now. So thank you. Great. Um, uh, thank you for that and, and, and sharing that. Um, so I see, uh, three um, um, uh, have their hands raised. Um, Ed, I saw your your hand earlier, so I'm going to go to you. 
Um, there are also a number of comments uh, in the chat, uh, including Judith, uh, Diane, uh, and now I see Trisha. So I'm going to try to, we're going to save the chat as well because we want Annie to be able to. And I can follow up by email afterwards. Yes, I'm happy to do exactly. that. Exactly. So. Um, but Ed, why don't you start off? Go ahead. Hi, Andy. It's good to see you again. Likewise, Ed. How are you? Good, good, good. And um, I missed the first couple of minutes of this, so you may have answered this already. Uh, when we first met, um, I, I believe you were Jay. Um, um, and you, you, how much of this is autobiogra autobiographical and how much of this stems from, from that experience? So uh, what, thank you for that question. But I will say I, I, I was unfortunately the target of a cancel campaign back at the sort of the beginning of the current phase. And um, what I would say is the overall feeling and mood is very autobiographical, but almost none of the details is, right? I, it was important to me to steer, this was not a book about my experience in the sense of yeah, a, you know, a factual book or nonfiction, but I wanted to get across in particular, as I mentioned, the subjective feeling, what it feels like to be targeted, because that's part of the more general idea that these campaigns are really antagonistic to the, the university as an institution. So that subjective feeling was important to that. So subjectively, yes, uh, very autobiographical, but in terms of specific details, largely no. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Peter, you're next, I'll go to Carrie. And then I think there's a, an interesting conversation happening over CRT, CRT in the book, mm -hmm. um, in the chat. Uh, that I want to also get to uh, at the end. But um, Peter, go ahead. Hi, Andy. Great to see you. Again. Likewise, Peter. Yes, nice to see you. Uh, one's a more serious question. The other is a, perhaps a less serious one. The more serious one is while, you know, while we're thinking about cancel culture, largely in terms of coming from the left, uh, more recently, at least, cancel culture is also coming from the right. You know, we have all of these book burnings. We have this tweet from uh, Dan Patrick of Texas claiming that they're going to ban CRT in, in higher education. So see, you know, it's my, my point is that it's, it's not something that is restricted to the left. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, so, well, you know, I suppose they're thinking, okay, well, they can do it, then we can do it. Yeah. So we're basically all going to be reduced to teaching about Harold and the Purple Crayon and very little else. So if you could address that. The less serious, perhaps, uh, is how you large your book with all of these wonderful little Easter eggs. I mean, there are all of these little you know, little allusions to Brave New World, but also to rock and popular music, as I had mentioned in the chat, you know, when the administrator says, well, you can call me Al. I was like, that's obviously Paul Simon. And then you had actually told me that there are lots of others. There are all sorts of like Grateful Dead comments, which I'd love for you to point them out to me. So if you could address either one of those questions. Um, sure. So uh, let me just say, without question, cancellations occur from the right as well as from the left. Um, and indeed, the book is trying to, its general theme is the danger of any all-consuming ideology, which can dis distort your perspective on things and turn you into an activist when you should be a scholar uh, within the university. And so it, it ultimately, that philosophical message is meant to be neutral between right and left. Right-leaning ideologies are just as dangerous and all-consuming as left-leaning ideologies, et cetera. And indeed, um, with, without question, there's some uh, right-wing stuff gets satirized in here as well. That said, on most of the major campuses, it's the, you know, the, the left-wing progressive movement is just significantly dominant. So the bulk of the satire is targeted against you know, the, the left-wing, but it absolutely has a neutral message about all ideology, and there is some right-wing representation as well. Um, as far as the Easter eggs, thank you for noticing some of them because that's that the, the book was a lot of fun to write and the people who find these things find it fun to read so one in particular throughout the book throughout there's just various references to classic rock songs and that's still not meant just for classic rock but it will turn out that the narrator this poor innocuous schmo as i called him jay 
uh, as you get to the end of the novel, there's a, a, an afterword, so to speak, you realize that, um, you know, he's part of his being innocuous is just he's a, a physician. He likes to do good in the world. He likes bowling and he likes classic rock. And what you basically realize by the end, this is a bit of a spoiler, is that that he essentially is narrating the story. And the reason, and the, the classic rock references are part of it. He's into classic rock, so he, it's him who's dropping them in, not me. But the reason that's important is, uh, it's on this theme of ideology, you are seeing these events through his lens quite explicitly. And at various points, it becomes clear he's not the most reliable narrator. Namely, he is portraying these events through his own particular point of view and not necessarily giving you an objective rendition of things, which is, of course, the great danger of all consuming ideology. It will st distort your perspective. So, in fact, to those who say, oh, students really wouldn't be that threatening, what you have to realize is you're seeing, you're experiencing the story through his subjective experience of it. Uh, uh, and indeed, that objective, that subjective experience might not be objectively accurate. So the Easter eggs are actually performing a function by alerting you to this fact that really the ultimate narrator of the story is not Pesson, but um, this guy, Jay. So thank you for noticing those. And they're fun. It is a lot of fun to read this book, Andy. I love it. I love the names of the characters, too, like A.M. Alec. Terrific. It's yeah. brilliant. Uh, thank you. <laughs> That's a right winger. That's a we got Amalek makes it has a, pres, a presence yes, in the Amalek. story, right? <laughs> I, I had it had a look at it a couple of times and I'm like, oh yeah. Um, so uh Carrie, uh Judith, I know Steven, I see you, I see you for a two-finger. Um, let me get Carrie and Judith and 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 I and I do want to just put on the table. Uh, Diane and Trisha's um uh, a debate from the chat and uh at the end. But Carrie, go ahead. So hi, Andy. Good. Hey, Carrie. Good to see you. So um, my question is really also, I guess, partly a follow-up to Ed Beck's, um, um, and uh, I guess I'll sort of cheerfully say that um, when you say that it's you know that the details don't echo your own story, I'm not sure I believe you. But um, and I'd say that because I I know your story through Richard Landis's book, which I read completely carefully when it first came out. And even in the passage that you read from the book, I hear echoes of some of the demands that were made and the advice that you were given. So I guess my question is something like this, two parts. One, as you were writing the book, how did you handle moments of autobiographical recognition? Um, and did the writing of the book help you reach a kind of state of equanimity about your own experience, which you clearly embody today. Um, and so the, to those two things. Wow, great question. Thank you so much for participating, Carrie. It's, it's a really uh, flattering and an honor that you're that you're here as well as everybody else. But um, so yeah, if you, if you wanna find out about, more about my story, Richard Landis did put out a book a year or two ago about it, if you, if you wanna uh, inflict that upon yourself. Uh, you know, and I certainly, under the advice of my lawyers, I will stick to my claim that it was not about me, <laughs> as in the passage that I read. <laughs> so, um, I did get a lawyer, as it uh, as it turned out in that particular case. Um, and so, you know, um, there's the spirit and the letter, and so maybe one ma manages to make sure the letter is not nonfiction and not about me. And then there's the spirit. And as I tried to say earlier to Ed, like trying to get across the subjective feeling, even if the individual details don't matter. And of course, a key aspect in my own particular case was the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that was sort of front and center at all of it. And that has absolutely no explicit presence in this novel. So in a deep way, in terms of the letter uh, and the facts, I, I'll stick to my claim that it's not about me. Um, uh, objectively, if perhaps subjectively. But the, the second question, thank you for that. Um, and I go back to the point about uh, how isolating these campaigns are. What I say about myself, um, and this is a message, I, when I, especially when I speak to non-academic audiences. In my own case, I mean, I was, I was this close to a nervous breakdown. And then I started getting these emails from people around the world. Someone started a change.org petition on my behalf and it went around the world and it got 10,000 signatures supporting me. And 
that was the thing that made me realize I was not alone, even though I felt very alone, and that I had 10,000 people out there and I represented them. And I was maybe the tip of a spear, but they were the 10,000 people pushing the spear into the lion's den here. And that support is what really turned me around personally from just being ready to utterly capitulate given collapse to deciding to stand up and fight. And so I tell everybody that when you hear of an event happening on campus, and you will hear of them if you sign up for the Alga Minor Daily Newsletter, you'll, you'll stay abreast of these things. It's so important to reach out to the faculty members who are being targeted to let them know you see, you hear, you're on their side. Even if you don't agree, and I do this all the time now, I'm, I'm friends with like a lot of the canceled people now because I, I write to almost everybody, even people whose politics I totally disagree with because there's something so antagonistic to the academy in these canceled campaigns and nobody should have to endure what, what they often entail. So having said that, um, writing this book absolutely was cathartic to me, even though it's not about me or about my experience. It was cathartic because what it does is um, it, it helps you see it through somebody else's eyes a little bit. And especially in the choice of satire, you know, it's just, it feels so good to make fun of your enemies, basically, right? And so by the time I'm done, I, by the time I was done writing it, I, I could look back at my own experience and realize on a deep level how just utterly ridiculous and absurd the whole thing was, right? It's, and, and that is what I ultimately believe these canceled campaigns are. They are ridiculous and absurd. That said, as I said to Miriam a few minutes ago, they're actually dangerous and need to be taken seriously. I think real violence can result from them, but nevertheless, intellectually, objectively, it's they're crazy. And again, that's why Never Green is set on the you know the former the site of a former uh, lunatic asylum to help bring that point out. So yeah, it was cathartic and it did help give me some equanimity. And in the same way as I hope. Once people read the book and they see a cancel campaign going on somewhere, they can say, look, never green over there. So too, I, by being able to classify my own experience as never green, it helps distance it from me psychologically and, and gives me that equanimity, as you put it. So thank you for that question. Yeah, I really appreciate the response. I should have, I should have had the lawyer uh, warning in my head. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't think of it. No, wor no worries. You'll be <laughs> hearing from my lawyer, however. Yeah. <laughs> You don't, no, no worries. You didn't divulge anything. That's fine, Andy. And thank you for sharing that. Um, Judith, go ahead. Oh, Andrew, thanks so much. I haven't read the book. And uh, from your account of the way you handled the major issues, you've nailed it. It sounds from a thank philosophical you. level, you've done a, a fabulous job about how victims are turned into victimizers. Um, I naively assumed, because I hadn't read your book, that you had Jewish characters no. in the novel. And I've threatened to write my own novel. I don't think I would do as well as you do about my experience as one of these victims. Um, and what's made it so difficult is the response of my fellow Jews. Yeah. And on the one hand, um, at, at best, they don't want to be involved they make excuses for this kind of behavior. Uh, the sort of thing I'm asking for is can't we just have anti-Semitism included among the forms of bigotry that we're supposed to be standing up against? Uh, you know, aren't we aligned with these other groups that are being targeted? So that's the best case, Jews. But then there are others that are not helping um, the image of us as allies who are engaged in homophobia and sexism and ableism. I mean, I really uh, had to suffer a great deal from some of these folks. And I do think that there's a problem within the academic Jewish community here. And it became most, you know, amazing to me when a Black Jewish classicist stood up uh, for me and she um, was attacked and accused of letting me weaponize her. And this, if you know this woman, Carol Livia Haran, you know, she doesn't let anybody do anything for anyone. And, and so that's the issue for me. I mean, why aren't our fellow Jews of more help and solidarity in this? 
Uh, thank you. It's nice to meet you. And I'm so sorry for your own experience, which you shared with me a few days ago. Uh, it's, it's dreadful. And like these can't, these things come in many different forms and many different degrees. Yeah. So I'm sorry for your own experience. Let me just mention, um, in terms of, again, the secret Jewish element, I have written a, a very short document called The Secret Jewish Guide to Nevergreen. So if your interest, folks are interested yes. in that element of the book, <laughs> it's, on, it's on the website, or you can email okay. me. I'll happily send it to you just yeah. to you know, point out all the Easter eggs and all the little clues about the way the book is deeply about the Jews without ever mentioning the Jews. Um, I, I, your, your question or comment was, was very rich and complex. And um, let me just say, we'll address one little part of it. Speaking of Richard Landis, he shared with me a cartoon some while back. It was a far side cartoon. And what you see, you're looking through the scope of a rifle and there's two bears and the rifle is pointing, is directed at one of the bears. And that bear is sheepishly pointing to the other bear like that, right? Um, uh, and Richard shared that with me. I think that reflects a partial answer to your question. Uh, it's scary to stand up for somebody who's the target of a cancel campaign, less that the target now is shifted over to you. And, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the Jewish demographic, Jews are targeted on campuses. Zionism is, is dirty. Israel is evil, genocidal, ethnic cleansing, racist, white supremacist, et cetera, et cetera. Anyone who stands up for Israel inherits those crowns. So, it takes unbelievable courage to stand up for Israel in that kind of environment. And then when a colleague of yours is being targeted, it takes unbelievable courage to side with that colleague because that, that rifle uh, target will be directed towards you. So this isn't excusing anybody or justifying. I think it's essential that we stand up because it, the accumulation of not standing up only strengthens the enemies ultimately. Um, but it's, it is hard. And maybe that explains why at least some people fail to rally to one side when one is being targeted. Uh, and as these surveys on academic freedom show, people are afraid to speak. They're afraid to have an opinion because lest they be targeted. So it's part of that general phenomenon as well. So thank you. I know that was a too short an answer to that. Thank, thank you for that, Judith. And thank you for your answer, uh, Andy. And I, you know, I think that in many cases, a lot is expected from faculty, you know, speak up, speak out. And um, for junior faculty, contingent faculty, non-tenure track, you know, there are real professional risks uh, right. from um, being on the wrong side of these issues. And I, I really feel like at AN, we need to protect the junior right. faculty and give them, right. our, you know, our back to them. Uh, and, and also, let me just add for students, social risks of, right? Like right, it's just right. real risks. Right. Um, Steve, you've been have you've had a two finger up for a while. So go ahead. You're on mute. You're on mute. Hear me now. Yes. OK, Steve, uh, you might not realize this, but you have a unique voice. I, I do a lot of reading and I read your book months ago as you were reading from it, I'm thinking to myself, this is Andy writing, this is Andy speaking. It is a unique way you have of, of, of using the words and it just stand out to me. Uh, now an aside and an observation, uh, Tufts University really, did, I'm a professor at Tufts, but retired, recently did a survey of their Jewish students and they came back with more than well over 50% felt threatened on the campus. And they finally said that they're going to start doing something about it. I don't know whether they will or not. I still have work to do there. But I'm wondering if in the realm of academia, if professors might get this kind of questionnaire in their campus to show how many professors feel threatened and show the administration how this is negatively affecting their entire university and their entire mission. I, I just throw that for the rest of the uh, academics here. The yeah. other thing, uh, the, the bear with the point, you could have uh, a, a sort of a cartoon with uh, Beria, the secret police chief under Stalin with his quote, you show me the man, I'll show you the crime. Uh, yeah. Show me the academic, I'll show you the crime because yeah. it's, it's so parallel, just for your next book. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And Steve, thank you so much just in general for uh, your support yeah. and your, your insights, which are plentiful and high quality. <laughs> thank you. Um, everybody, it is one o'clock and I realize, you know, some of you may need to leave uh, for other engagements, teaching, research and otherwise. So um, uh, I, I do want to just take a moment to thank Andy thank you. Um, for your work, um, for uh, being part of AEN, sharing your experiences um, and, and, and writing this really a powerful novel. 
uh, that that resonates for for many of us. Now we we have we are saving the chat. You haven't been able to see it, Andy, but it's been quite robust um, uh, with debate, which is part of AEN. Uh, we uh, 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 welcome differences of opinion on these issues. So we're saving it. We'll share it. So there are Wonderful. Uh, some things I want to actually go back to the chat and 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 engage with with members. Um, very pleased. Thank you for uh, the kind comments about AEN. Uh, that were shared. Um, uh, we certainly see uh, our role to, to be that support system uh, and to be an educational uh, voice, right, for, uh, for the campuses, for administrators, for faculty, uh, and of course, for the students. Um, but we can, if it's okay with you, Andy, you know, some people need to get off, but can you stay a few more minutes? I can stay a few more minutes. Absolutely. And I'm happy okay. to engage by email too, if anyone wants to email. Yes. So. And we're going to save the chat. So, um, we'll stay on just a few more minutes. Um, uh, and, and Lee, I know you had your, your hand up, please. Yeah. So first of all, um, I look forward to reading your book Thank you. Uh, very much. And, uh, I, as a, uh, a member of the uh, CUNY English department, I just want to say that I appreciate your thinking about uh, the question of the reach of a work of fiction, which is very right. different than the very narrow reach of um, something academic. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts about something that I find extremely troubling. Um, uh, one academic friend of mine uh, very pointedly, uh, I thought, summarized his sense of the position of Israel which he, he simply said, and he had been involved with me in terms, his field is philosophy and literature um, in Holocaust studies. And he said that the position of Israel in terms of defense is impossible to imagine. There, there you know, the uh, situation and that the defense situation that presents itself. And what is for me very hard to grasp is how um, I'm talking, you know, my Jewish liberal friends and colleagues, they can't make themselves expert in, in all issues. They kind of join with a certain uh, liberal community that includes an anti-Israel position. And what I cannot understand is that the, the idea of academics who are trained in thinking kind of um, being aware of Israel's, on the one hand, very um, hmm, extraordinary issues of defense that face it, and yet collapsing Israel with all kinds of other states that are, that are pure aggressors, because clearly the situation of defending yourself and, and um, absolute aggression is completely, these are completely different. It is, and um, I just don't understand the, la the thinking, the, the academics trained people, yeah. unable to think in clear ways. I'm including a lot of my, you know, good natured friends who'll say to me, well, what about the Palestinians? I mean, I, I, I have right. sympathy too for the Palestinian population. Um, but I don't know, I wonder how you, you see, it's, it's disturbing to me. I mean, I'm a child of survivors. It's like a whole community and world can be taken in, in no. fundamentally irrational ways and then act on it. And then what is our efforts as magnificent as AEN is, what is our efforts in what, what can we do in the face of this anyway? So oh, that was that was enormous. And you and I agree 100 percent, I can tell on many key issues that, with what you said. So let me just say with respect to the novel to bring it back there. Um, yes. You know, one of the themes of the novel is just what academia might look like to outside eyes. There's a reason the main character is, you know, he's from off campus and he's invited to campus. So he's he's looking at it through non-academic eyes and he's got this expression he called academentia. There's something we all know the value and merit of what we do as academics. We wouldn't do it otherwise. But there's this whole aspect or angle to academics, which can be crazy, it's unmoored. And so he refers to that as ac academic. So that's part one. Part two, I did mention this idea of inversion of reality. And I share, share with you 
this perspective. And that's, that's part of the theme of ideology. When you're gripped by an ideology, not only, it doesn't merely distort your perspective, but it can literally turn, you know, turn things upside down, turn black into white, et cetera. And that is exactly, you know, that's a key theme of this novel. And I would suggest that at least many of the anti-Israel, anti-Zionist people on our campuses are gripped by some ideology. In some cases, it's Jew hatred. So uh, is the ideology, even if they, they that not on the surface, it's going to be deep down. So thinking of Steve Gersoff's uh, uh, anecdote about the Stalin police commissioner, right? Like um, uh, it's because on some deep level, they're antagonistic to Jews that they see Israel through the darkest possible lens. And it's not the other way around that they have an objective view of Israel and they come to reach this conclusion of evils of the, of the evilness of Israel. It's the antipathy towards the Jews, which distorts the perspective. And so that's the theme of the novel. And that is of course, ultimately what insanity is. That's why I'm locating this thing in the grounds of a former insane asylum, precisely because insanity is what happens when you're, the, no medical opinion is about to fall. <laughs> but insanity, one way to characterize it is your set of ideas fails to anchor properly onto reality. And I think that's what's going on in a lot of the campus anti-Israel scene in general. And that's absolutely what the book is trying to explore and get across. So without talking about Israel. <laughs> So thank you for that. Thank you, Andy. Um, Andy, before we close, um, I have a question. Um, what's next on your plate? What, what, what are you writing now? Um, and what are you working on now? What's the next book or the next article? Um, uh, give us a taste of what's up. Um, uh, so I guess the short version is I had so much fun writing this novel that I'm going to write another novel and that I'm going to start it this summer. It's, that's usually the only time I have for writing. I have pretty teaching heavy position. So, um, it's going to be another novel and in some ways it's completely different from this one. Uh, and other ways it will be a continuation of the same themes. So that's about all I can say about it now, since I have not yet written even the first line of that, but at least the vision I have, uh, can be described that way. Um, and I recommend this, you know, other folks I see, you know, um, I'm at that point in my career, I'm ready to try some new things, some different things. And it was just very refreshing. Always wanted to write a novel. This is now my third. So I, I clearly have a taste for it. Um, it just feels really good to just use your brain in a different way after a bunch of years using it, like, you know, in similar ways. So any of you, one of you just earlier mentioned thinking about doing a novel, I, I recommend it, try it. You don't know until you try it. And uh, as in response to Carrie's question, it was personally cathartic to me, providing equanimity. Uh, it, it's, it's, it can be good for you. And hopefully, obviously it will be published and successful as well. But first and foremost, it has to be good for you to make it worth doing. And in my case, this was, and so I, I'm gonna continue, I think with another novel. Wonderful, well, thank you. We'll look forward to that. Um, and uh, I think exploring with different, you know, medium are really, is really, um, uh, exciting and, and, and a new opportunity. I know our junior faculty section are thinking of doing podcasts for AEN. That would be a first with doing a podcast. And, and then a few other faculty are thinking about a graphic novel or a graphic. I said, okay, just do a pamphlet first, maybe. But um, using sort of different um, writing styles and genres in order to, to uh, engage, right? In order to, to, um, uh, reach uh, different. You know, the, the future yeah. is video and graphic, not like novels. I think, you know, with due respect <laughs> to the English professor, right? Like people don't read anymore, right? People, they watch things now and listen. So podcasts, I think have some promise as well. So, um, you know, but I, I'm, I'm too old to drive graphics and videos. So, so I went with the novel, which is what I'm familiar and with. We have but, our junior faculty section. Yes, that's right. That's right. Right. Well, Andy, thank you so much. Thank and, you, Miriam. Thank you, those uh, who have who have stayed on. Um, for everybody uh, celebrating Purim uh, uh, tonight and tomorrow, um, happy holiday. Uh, enjoy those hamantashen. Um, read uh, Nevergreen. It's a great novel for Purim. <laughs> Um, and uh, we'll see you next time at AEN's next webinar. Thank Thanks, you, AEN. Thank you.